liebe Seherinnen und Hörerinnen des YouTube-Kanals der Zeitschrift International, schönen guten Tag, hier spricht Fritz Edlinger. Das ist wiederum, wie bereits vor einigen äh, Tagen, ein kurzes äh, Intro, eine kurze Einleitung eines englischsprachigen Gespräches und Interviews. Es geht wiederum um die aktuelle Krise, äh, Schlagwort äh, Ukraine, U Russland, NATO. Unser regelmäßiger äh, Schweizer Politikwissenschaftler und Mitarbeiter Pascal Lothars, für der zusätzlich neben seiner Tätigkeit an einer japanischen Universität als Politikwissenschaftler auch eine eigene, ähm, ein eigenes, ähm, eine eigene Initiative gestartet hat, nämlich Neutrality Study Network. Und er hat in dieser Kapazität wiederum ein Gespräch mit einem äh, in den USA tätigen internationalen Experten und Politikwissenschaftler geführt, nämlich diesmal mit dem ähm, Herrn Professor Anatol Lieven, der britischer Staatsbürger ist, langjähriger Osteuropa-Experte und seit kurzem, und das ist sehr wichtig, äh, Senior Research Fellow des äh, US-amerikanischen Quincy Instituts. Das Gespräch äh, spricht dann wieder für sich. Es setzt auch das Gespräch, das wir vor einiger Zeit geführt haben, mit dem ehemaligen äh, letzten US-amerikanischen Botschafters in Moskau, äh, in der Sowjetunion, Jack Medlock Jr. fort. Auch Jack Medlock Jr. arbeitet für dieses Quincy Institut und äh, das lege ich den Seherinnen und Hörerinnen äh, sehr ans Herz. Sollten Sie dieses Institut noch nicht kennen, schauen Sie einmal auf deren Webseite. Es ist eine hochinteressante Initiative von äh, Lieven wird das so nicht das am Beginn des Gespräches äh, vorstellen, von linken Republikanern bis hin äh, linken Demokraten und unabhängigen Experten, die sich vehement gegen bestimmte Aspekte der US-amerikanischen Außen- und Sicherheitspolitik wenden. Das Schlagwort ist, der Hinweis, wann dieses Institut gegründet wurde, mehr braucht man dann schon gar nicht mehr sagen, nämlich im Jahr 2003 als Antwort auf den ja bekanntlich völlig völkerrechtswidrigen Angriff der USA und einiger westlicher Alliierter auf den Irak. Und dieses Quincy-Institut gehört im Moment nicht nur in Amerika, sondern weltweit zu den kritischsten Kommentatoren äh, und kritischsten Initiativen äh, und äh, äh, Expertisen, äh, die sich mit dem aktuellen Ukraine-Konflikt befassen. Insofern ist dieses Gespräch wieder sehr interessant. Es ist ein abschließender Hinweis. Es wurde einen Tag vor den jüngsten russischen Beschlüssen der äh, Anerkennung der beiden äh, ostukrainischen äh, Provinzen als eigenständige äh, Staaten aufgenommen, so dass dieses Thema äh, in dem Gespräch keine Rolle spielt, aber dafür äh, wird wieder ausführlich über bestimmte historische, politikwissenschaftliche, militärische äh, Hintergründe und Aspekte des aktuellen Konfliktes äh, gesprochen und zwar aus einer Perspektive heraus, aus einer Sicht heraus, wie wir sie leider in den meisten europäischen Medien und auch in den eigentlich allen europäischen Regierungen nicht mehr gewohnt sind zu hören. In diesem Sinn herzlichen Dank an Professor Lieven, herzlichen Dank an Pascal äh, Lothars und viel Vergnügen wäre etwas übertrieben, aber äh, schauen Sie sich das an, hören Sie sich das an und für Kommentare, für Likes, für weitere Empfehlungen sind wir natürlich als Zeitschrift International auch sehr dankbar. Schönen guten Tag. Welcome to another interview. I am Pascal from the Neutrality Studies Network and in collaboration with the Austrian magazine International, 
link below. I'm talking today to Dr. Anatole Liefen, who is a British author, policy analyst, former professor at Georgetown University, and currently a senior research fellow at the Quincy Institute for Responsible Statecraft. Dr. Liefen is intimately familiar with Eastern Europe and Central Asia. From 1985 to 1998, he worked as a journalist in the region covering the wars in Afghanistan, in Chechnya, and the Southern Caucasus. He is the author of several books on Russia and its neighbors, including The Baltic Revolutions, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, and the Path to Independence, and more recently, Ukraine and Russia, a fraternal ri rivalry. Dr. Liefen wrote several other important books, but today we are here to discuss the situation in and ar around Ukraine, about which he has published by now several pieces and been quite outspoken. He wrote an essay in defense of Ambassador Jack Matlock, who we had on this channel before, arguing that it's first and foremost Ukraine that had to come to terms with its own diversity and that the conflict with Russia is heavily impacted by the Ukrainian government's failing to find a workable deal for its own minorities. He also recently published an article in Foreign Policy in which he argued for security cooperation among NATO and Russia. Uh, Dr. Liefen. I want to talk to you about all of this today, so thank you for taking the time. Hello. Um, before we get into the nitty gritty of Ukraine and Russia, let me ask you an, an, a warm up question about your current employer, because a lot of our viewership is in Europe and probably not that familiar with the Quincy Institute. Uh, what exactly is the Quincy Institute? How does it compare to working there um, instead of a, of a university? And um, is do you know, is the Quince, does the Quincy Institute have any stance on what's currently going on or are views among your colleagues fairly mixed of what's happening between Ukraine and Russia? The, the Quincy Institute <clears throat> really grew originally uh, out of opposition to the Iraq war in 2003. Uh, I think that was when many of us first came together uh, and came together, by the way, from uh, both the, the left and the right. Uh, so the, the the Quincy is internally a, a coalition of uh, you know not extreme conservatives but moderate conservatives and moderate leftists. But we all have one thing uh, in common, uh, which is that we oppose um, uh, the search for American primacy in the world by military means. We you know we we believe in cooperation rather than rivalry between the the great powers. Uh, and we oppose the militarization of American policy. Uh, and uh, from that point of view, we, uh, unlike some of the other think tanks, um, we do have a, you could say, an ideological goal, you know, and uh, we're, we're all on the same side about this, though we differ fairly considerably about, uh, about domestic uh, politics, although actually not entirely, because the, the the Quincy is, for example, also very much opposed to the militarization of the American police. So while you know, while we certainly wouldn't support slogans like defund the police or abolish the police, you know, we we, we strongly um, criticize the you know the heavily armed and trigger happy and paramilitary aspect of the of the American police today for. I suppose obvious reasons, right? Uh, and um, the Quincy uh, only got started, however, a couple of years ago, basically because it took um, it took the intervening period of sixteen years from the Iraq War uh, to um, you know to put together donors. The donors are uh, are uh, also, um, in terms of domestic politics, a, a very um, a very mixed bunch, uh, but. Um, have also come together uh, in opposition to uh, American military dominance and primacy in the world. And of course, uh, our support and our own attitudes have been heavily influenced by the repeated failures of this policy um, uh, over the past 20 years. Obviously, the disaster of the Iraq war, the failure in Afghanistan, uh, the disastrous intervention in, in Libya, um, Syria, which um, only narrowly avoided becoming another American disaster, thanks to, to, to Barack Obama. Um, and uh, the Quincy, you know, does, does certainly does not support um, the, uh, 
the ambitions of either Russia or Iran or China, uh, but equally does not believe that um, uh, America uh, can simply disregard the interests of these countries uh, and um, you know, attempt to impose its will uh, on them by either military or uh, economic intimidation. In other words, uh, the Quincy does also have a realist attitude to it. We believe that there are um, great states in the world, uh, that um, the interests of these states are not determined by their political systems. In other words, uh, uh, even, well, as was, by the way, true, I mean, a, a much more liberal and democratic Russian government in the 1990s was also categorically opposed to NATO enlargement. Uh, and members of that government and its supporters, you know, told us at the time that if this were if NATO membership were extended, or there was a threat to extend it to, to Ukraine and Georgia, that this would mean deep confrontation and quite possibly war. So uh, that that is the um, that is the profile uh, of the uh, of, of the Quincy. Uh, you're a British uh, author and scholar, right? So the Quincy does have a lot, have like international connections. Or can you say like where it is? It's centered in the US, in Washington DC, but it has uh, it has pe members also from Europe working there, right? Yeah, to some extent. I mean, I think I'm the um, the European branch of the Quincy at present. And my <laughs> office is behind me. Um, can't see the bed at the moment. Uh, but um, certainly the Quincy uh, looks for alliances and support uh, with um, people all over the world, really, um, but uh, certainly in Europe, uh, who uh, also do not believe um, in attempts at the further expansion of Western power. Um, I suppose, though from a slightly different angle, both the conservatives and the liberals among us uh, both believe that uh, America and the West should concentrate on urgent domestic reform, you know, rather than uh, the um, you know a, a attempts at, if you like, global domination. Mm -hmm. um, and as far as Europe is concerned, um, we strongly support the European Union and the role of the European Union in, in Eastern Europe. But I think it's fair to say that, like many people, we've become sceptical about um, the possibility of the further enlargement of the European Union uh, and um, also the chances of turning the European Union into some you know, European super state. So um, we are we're not getting to Ukraine and Russia, but I have just one more question on my mind now. That's uh, there's this there's this interesting tension in Europe of some people who say Europe should have its own military capabilities different from NATO, but the transatlantic network is quite opposed to that because it would weaken NATO. Uh, at Quincy, are you are you equally conflicted, or uh, do you have a view of whether Europe should have its own military its own military? Well, we certainly think that that Europe should uh, do much more to uh, deal with its own security, uh, partly because given, you know, the tremendous unpopularity in the American public of American, you know, more American commitments, especially in Europe, where, after all, you know, so many in, in America point out, Europe is quite rich enough and strong enough um, you know, to account for its own defence. Uh, I, I myself, I, I actually have a, an essay coming out in Politique étrangère uh, in April, um, saying that the European Union looks, needs to look, um, really needs to define its military role, and European countries do, in terms of threats to Europe, which um, Europe both can, you know, does have the physical capacity to meet and should have the will to meet. And I talk about the Balkans, you know, where only a, frankly, a tiny number of, of Western troops and the threat of American intervention are preventing new wars in Kosovo and Bosnia. And where, of course, Europe failed so shamefully um, in the early 1990s. And then I talk about Western Africa, where you know so much of the recent news has, has indicated <coughs> the French effort there is is faltering. 
um, the Europeans have done very little in concrete terms to help. Uh, and yet this is a, an area where a combination of you know, government dysfunction, population growth, deep poverty, corruption, of course, Islamist extremism, and the growing threat of climate change, you know, risk state collapse with you know really really serious consequences for europe above all in terms of migration so um so this is something that um th these are things that europe should be able to do i i have to say though that um i have become very skeptical about whether uh, europe actually will do this and i well we could talk about this in the context of ukraine but i i, I find the you know european behavior in in recent weeks to have been frankly, for a European, as I still consider myself, humiliating. Let's let's go there. I mean, I've only given a very brief introduction of you, but your, your relationship with Ukraine and Eastern Europe, Central Asia is quite deep. Can you tell us a little bit more, especially about Ukraine, what, what your engagement over the past couple, decade or two decades has been with the country? Well, my engagement in Ukraine goes back... Um, almost three decades, because as a correspondent for the, the London Times in the former Soviet Union and, and then based in Moscow, uh, I traveled to Ukraine very frequently. And uh, I wrote a book which came out in 1999 that you mentioned Ukraine and Russia, a fraternal rivalry, you know, based on my travels in Ukraine. And um, the thesis I set forward in that book is that um, Ukraine uh, is a deeply divided country with very different versions of its national identity. Uh, and um, to a lesser extent, uh, different versions of its geopolitical alignment. Uh, and I said in the book, which you know, came out 23 years ago now, that any attempt to rigidly define Ukraine one way or the other, either in terms of defining its internal identity or uh, trying to force Ukraine to a choice between the West and Russia uh, would lead to disaster um, and, of course, Russian intervention. So my uh, line has always been that uh, Ukraine, by its very nature, uh, is a country which needs to be left alone to find its own way. Uh, by the way, I blame uh, the Russian government very much in 2013 for attempting to bring Ukraine into the Eurasian Union, because I was always convinced that that would set off, you know, colossal protests and rebellion within Ukraine, which of course it did. Uh, but I also warned that any attempt to bring Ukraine uh, into NATO, well, I, I've always said that membership of the European Union is is so far away for Ukraine that you know it can almost be shelved for another generation, because it depends on internal reforms, which you know, are, are faltering. But I've argued for 25 years that uh, any attempt to um, bring Ukraine into NATO would, would lead both to revolt in some of the Russian areas of the country and to Russian intervention, which of course also happened. Two questions about this. Um, on the one hand, what do you make out of this current media onslaught about oh uh, ukraine should be should should the door should be open for ukraine to join nato when it's pretty much clear to anyone who knows how nato functions and what the what the current distribution of of, of opinions is within nato that this is is purely hypothetical um while on the other hand russia is demanding uh, security guarantees and and a talk actually about uh this common uh, common european security that's one the other one is what do you make out you you made this point in an article that you wrote in defense of ambassador jack matlock saying that yeah there are currently um the tendencies, nationalistic tendencies and worrisome tendencies inside Ukraine that label anything that does not agree with Ukraine being a more or less unitary uh, um, society as as outsiders and something that they want to eradicate. Do you do you see this still boiling or can you explain this, uh, flesh this out a bit more? Well, uh, I mean, to give one example, the Minsk II process, uh, agreement of 2015, aimed at bringing peace to the Donbass, uh, includes a, a proviso that the linguistic, which means Russian, uh, 
uh, uh, rights and cultural autonomy um, of Russians within Ukraine should be fully respected. Uh, well, there have been a whole row of laws over the past three years, which have flatly contradicted that, and which, by the way, uh, were actually condemned by the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe, though only because the Hungarians, who also have a minority in Ukraine, uh, protested against this. Um, and, I mean, obviously, the present Ukrainian position on the Donbass, that the Donbass must return to a unitary Ukraine uh, without local autonomy, and in circumstances where the Ukrainian central government and parliament can continue to act, uh, you know, to attempt over time to abolish the Russian language within Ukraine. I mean, that's, I mean, it's completely inex unacceptable in itself. It certainly will never be acceptable to the people of the Donbass. But also, of course, it totally contradicts Western principles, you know, that we have pursued uh, with regard to other ethnically divided societies. So but what, 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 what we hear in the West is that the Donbass, uh, these two wannabe republics, are puppets of uh, Russia, and the only reason why they are alive is basically because of Russia supports them militarily. And they're, if it wasn't for Russia, then the Donbass would be basically a peaceful part of Ukraine and it would be all united. Is, what, what do you make out of that? But that's nonsense. I mean, you know, I traveled extensively in the Donbass. Um, if you look at all the opinion polls before 2014, since 2014, of course, it's not easy to trust opinion polls on either side you know, of the lines. Uh, but there was you know, overwhelming support for local autonomy um, and, of course, for um, official status for the Russian language in Ukraine. Not, of course, Russian as the, as, as the official language of Ukraine. No, that has to be Ukrainian. But that language, you know, that the Russian language should be... Um, should be protected. So no, I mean, uh, of course, uh, Russian troops, very likely disguised, are fighting in the Donbass. Um, but undoubtedly, uh, the rebellion of 2014 also had serious local support, as by the way, of course, did the, the, um, the Russian intervention in Crimea um, had local support there. I wanted to so, ask you about that. Is Do, do you think that if this, um, that referendum in, in Crimea in 2014 was done under very, very suspicious <laughs> circumstances. And really, Russia doesn't look very good uh, in it. It's really easy to say, like, look, this is all made up. But according to your personal opinion, if if this was done according to the book with international supervision and so on and so forth, and with the agreement of all, all parties, uh, would there still have been a majority for um, of, of Crimeans to say, like, yes, you want to join Russia? Oh, in my opinion, yes, undoubtedly. Uh, by the way, I mean, the, the, the idea has been advanced by Tom Graham, you know, former US diplomat and, and others, that um, we really need to try to solve all the present um, territorial disputes in Europe uh, on, uh, on the, the common basis of local democracy. In other words, actually go to the local people with an internationally supervised you know, United Nations supervised um, referenda uh, and see what they think. Incidentally, on this score, you said that, uh, you, you know, that the, these, all these places are Russian puppets and you, you hear that as well about Abkhazia and South Ossetia, where, by the way, it's also totally untrue. You know, the Abkhaz population is completely united. In, I mean, the ethnic Abkhaz, um, but also the, the Russian and Armenians there were absolutely united uh, in support of independence from from Georgia. It's so interesting that nobody talks about Nagorno-Karabakh as simply a Russian puppet, although, uh, you know, the Russian peacekeepers have went in there as well to save what was left. Or now, Moldova. Does, uh, uh, or Moldova, uh, but I'm thinking, particularly, I'm thinking particularly of Nagorno-Karabakh, um, you know, which could also be portrayed and sometimes in the West was portrayed as, you know, Russia stepping in to extend its empire. We didn't hear nearly so much, of course, about Nagorno-Karabakh and the illegitimacy of it and so forth in this context. That, I fear, had absolutely nothing to do with Western standards of legality or democracy, common standards. It had everything, of course, to do with the Armenian diaspora in France and America. Um, when I was a journalist there, it was astonishing the difference between Western journalists' sympathy for the Armenians and you know, automatic dismissal of the Abkhaz and the Ossetes as simply puppets of Russia. And that was to do, you know, basically with ethnic affinity.
I, I think we can agree that if we, if the principle of local um, self-determination was actually taken serious in Europe and Western Europe as well, um, well, we would have a completely different map, including uh, Catalonia, including the Basque Country, probably uh, Scotland <laughs> and, uh, the, and the Kosovo. Well, the Kosovo stay as it is, but and certainly in Israel, we would have a big change with the with the the local population of the Palestinians. Um, so. Well, I'm not that optimistic, much as I would love to see a democratic solution to to um, to the Israel-Palestinian dispute. Alas, I don't see that coming anytime soon. But let, the I mean, the main thing in realist terms uh, is that um, on the basis of common standards, we basically offer Russia a deal uh, saying, look, Serbia is not going to reconquer Kosovo or if it does, uh, you know, it, um, it, it will lead to another massive crisis you know, with the West uh, and cannot reconquer Kosovo without colossal ethnic cleansing. On the other hand, of course, um, Mitrovica, the Serbian area of, of Kosovo, has to return to Serbia. There's no question about it. You accept a democratic solution there and we will accept a democratic solution for Crimea, um, Abkhazia, Ossetia. And the Donbass, my own view is that you would see a large majority in the Donbass for guaranteed autonomy within Ukraine. Um, but it has to be, you know, a completely guaranteed and cast iron. Incidentally, um, once again, it's very difficult to say what opinions are now, because, you know, there's been considerable, you know, action within Ukraine or Ukraine proper or what's left of Ukraine or call it what you will to suppress you know, pro-Russian parties and politicians. But certainly when I was traveling there previously, there was very strong support throughout the east and south of the country uh, for the idea of a federal Ukraine uh, in which, you know, regions uh, would have rights, you know, comparable, say, to those of the German lender. Um, you know, in, in other words, considerable control over local affairs, including language. So, um, you, you know, the... Um, the line of the Western media that this is a struggle of democracy against authoritarianism is, to put it mildly, only part of the story. How how come that this solution didn't didn't emerge over the last thirty years a federal Ukraine? I mean, there have been considerable pushes for it, and not at least also from the outside. I mean, the Minsk One, Minsk Two, and so on. They 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 prescribed federalization and and local autonomy, and it wasn't wasn't implemented. Um, why? It, you know, you, you see this throughout the post-colonial world. Um, you know, the the anti-colonial governments that you know succeeded the French and the British took over French and British means of government, highly centralized, highly authoritarian, police-based. Because, and you know, of course, one also has to sympathize with this because in in a new state where you're very afraid of it disintegrating, naturally. The tendency is to centralize, 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 keep authority, you know, at the center. Um, but the problem is, in the case of Ukraine, this has now become mixed up uh, to, to a limited extent before 2014, but much more since then, you know, with this program of ethnic nationalism, of ethnic Ukrainianization, you know, moves to abolish the Russian language within Ukraine, uh, by the way. I mean, the Ukrainian state is so weak and so much of the Russian uh, of the Ukrainian population speaks Russian that so far in practical terms, um, these have not gone very far. But the long term implications are obvious. This, by the way, was one reason uh, for why after uh, six years of basically, you know, uh, watching Ukraine and, you know, supporting the Donbass, but not putting you know, uh, greatly increased pressure on Ukraine. Last year, uh, Russia, you know, really vastly increased its pressure to the you know present point where you do have large numbers of Russian troops deployed on the on the border, uh, because Moscow had always reckoned um, that in the long run, the Ukrainian people were going to realize they weren't going to get into NATO, they weren't going to get into the European Union. Um, and so why not do, you know, not 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 rejoin the Soviet Union or, you know, but do a reasonable deal with with Russia. Um, uh, 
and but the confidence in this was also founded in in the belief uh you know which putin said in an essay last year um about the the close cultural ties of uh not all the Ukrainian people, of course, not those in Western Ukraine, but of many Ukrainians and Russians, uh, founded on you know language, on intermarriage, on common history, all these things. But of course, w when Moscow began to think that you know if sustained over a generation, Ukrainian policies were actually going to destroy the cultural basis for this, that was one reason why they decided that now they must put their foot down. Why, why is it that we don't, that, that we're not escaping this narrative of Russia as the enemy over there uh, when uh, to anyone with a reasonable sense of European history understands that there has always been tension and always been a back and forth and Russia is fairly and squarely a part of Europe. Why is it that Gorbachev's a uh, vision of a common European home could not be realized. And do you see a, a way forward with this crisis or, or out of this crisis into a common uh, European security structure, which Russia actually demands, and which reminds me very much of what the Soviet Union did and finally led to, to the CSCE, right? That was a, that was a Soviet idea, <laughs> implemented through the neutrals and then and co uh, commonly negotiated, and that became a European solution to a European problem. So do you have thoughts on this? Well, in in the 1990s, you know, Russia became so weak uh, <clears throat> that, frankly, the West decided that it didn't matter, you know, that, that it could do anything and Russia's objections didn't count. Now, of course, that was uh, always, um, in part, it was always a mistake uh, because, uh, as I have often said, you know, real geopolitical power in the world is not absolute, it's local and relative. Um, in other words, it is the power that one country is willing and able to bear to bring to bear on a particular issue or in a particular place relative to what another power is able but also willing to bring to bear. And you, you see that in so many cases. Um, you know, nobody could conceivably you know, fantasize uh, that in absolute terms, Pakistan and America are equals or, or that Pakistan is superior to America. But it turns out that in Southern, Af Southern and Eastern Afghanistan, Pakistan is more powerful than America because Pakistan is there. It's there. It has a deep stake in that society. It's always going to be there on Afghanistan's borders. Uh, it has a, a, you know, a tremendous economic hold over Afghanistan. But also, as we've seen, Pakistan has been willing to run immense risks, colossal risks, for the sake of what it regards as its vital interests. In Afghanistan. Well, it's no different with Russia. As Russia, I mean, even in the 1990s, you know, Russia had more real power on the ground in parts of Ukraine and in the Caucasus than the West did. And in the end, I mean, that also comes down, speaking as a realist, to the, the oldest and clearest test of all of a country's vital interests, which is that they are interests for which a country is in the last resort prepared to fight. Now, Russia has demonstrated that in the last resort, it is prepared to fight for its vital interests uh, in the former Soviet Union. And we have in recent weeks stated absolutely clearly, categorically openly, that we are not prepared to fight. We are not prepared to send troops to defend Ukraine. Um, and so ultimately, that means that Russia is in a superior position. Now, I don't think that that means that Russia has actually decided to invade Ukraine. Uh, but the point is that if it does, you know, NATO will not go to war. But the, um, West, but, but the West has this, has been emphasizing so and so much that it's uh, shoring up its troops on the NATO territory and sending British uh, troops to Poland and, and uh, the, all the talk about the Baltic states being afraid and like shoring up their, um, their security and their preparedness. Uh, so there seems to be this kind of confusion of what a, an, an attack on Ukraine would mean for, for, for NATO, because even if, even if actually tanks from Russia were rolling all the way to Kiev, that would still not imply any attack on NATO territory, would it? 
No, it wouldn't. And frankly, if it did, uh, which it doesn't, but I mean, if the Russians had a serious intention of attacking these countries, um, then the number of troops that we have sent to defend them would be pathetically inadequate. You know, the, 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 if you look at the numbers, um, you know, Britain has sent one battalion, uh, Denmark has sent two planes, you know, Holland has sent one frigate, uh, America has sent 8,500 troops. Well, no, actually it hasn't, it said it would, I think it sent 5,000 so far. You know, that would not stop the Russian army. But the point is that Russia has no intention of attacking these places. So there is a um, an element of pure theatricality, you know, about NATO's response. And in a way, I mean, that's why this whole crisis suits um, our traditional security elite so well, because it is the, the, the Cold War scenario in Europe, not, of course, the Cold War scenario in Africa or part or Southeast Asia. But we uh, we parade our steadfastness, you know, against the the Eastern threat, but in the deep conviction that actually we will never have to fight. This is an ideal, an ideal confrontation from NATO's point of view, because NATO is not an alliance that is configured to fight. You know, it, it's a security alliance, but not a fighting alliance. Whenever it's tried to fight since the end of the Cold War, um, the results have been either that America has taken over and pushed NATO out of the way, as in Kosovo um, and Libya, uh, or of course that the NATO contribution has turned into a pathetic failure, as in Afghanistan. So, um, so yes, I mean, there's uh, th this is to some extent a um, you know a, th a theatrical performance. So, what's what's in your opinion? What's more important in this entire crisis, uh, deterring Russia? or indoctrinating the people who, who make up the NATO alliance, because a lot of what we hear also from Washington is clearly uh, geared towards local consumption, right? Mm. Uh, well, well, I mean, various great interests go into, you know, maintaining NATO and the idea of NATO, you know, as this essential force. First of all, as you well know, it's, it is the terror of the Europeans at being left on their own, um, you, you know, a, a, a total, um, which was so much reinforced by the failure in 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 Bosnia, you know, in in the early nineties. Um, but a, a deep um, and probably correct conviction that Europe, you know, is is un unwilling to do the things necessary uh, to maintain its own security although actually of course the best thing it could do would be to maintain would be to make a deal with russia in which in which case there would be no threat to nato security from the east but even you know, if you talk to more honest european officials in private they, they will say it's not uh, some of them will even say it's not about russia at all um some will say it's not only about russia it's also that if a new war broke out in the balkans and the americans did not intervene Europe would fail again, miserably, you know, to, to contain this. Um, and then, of course, there's a specific thing in the case of France, um, which is that France has become more and more dependent on the United States to maintain France's sphere of influence in Western Africa against the rise of, of Islamism. Without, you know, given that European support has been pathetic there, without American support, um, France could not sustain that campaign. Well, it's failing already. Um, so there is the the European, you know, b belief that America has to remain in Europe, and NATO is the, you know, is is the um, source of this uh, commitment. There is the American, of course, uh, belief that America, uh, sorry, that NATO is um, the best possible vehicle and base for American geopolitical power in the western parts of Eurasia and the Middle East. Um, because, of course, America dominates NATO. NATO, in the last resort, will do what America says. Um, very occasionally, France and Germany, in extreme cases, will push back against this, but not often. Uh, and, of course, um, NATO is airstrip one. I mean, the American bases in, uh, in Europe um, are critical for the power projection of America, uh, you know, in the Middle East in particular, and Northern Africa. Um, now, of course, you could do this in terms of bilateral agreements with European countries, but that would, you know, NATO creates this pretty thin 
impression, you know, of an, e an alliance of equals, which of course is an unbelievable joke, but still. Whereas, of course, if, um, if Italy and Germany and, and Britain um, simply had American bases, that would look much more like a neo-colonial, you know, or quasi-imperial relationship of dependency. And then, of course, within Europe, um, there are the interests of uh, the, you know, the, the NATO security elites and their branches, in effect, uh, in every country. And, you know, the huge um, media influence that these have, you know, the willingness of Western journalists, alas, you know, to reprint without criticism, whatever is said. And as I say, the, the, the great thing, from the point of view of German soldiers, officers, you know, Danes, everyone else, uh, is that, you know, NATO guarantees employment, you know, and of course, NATO itself, the NATO staff is a colossal provider of jobs for military bureaucrats. But it's an alliance that does not and will not fight. So what could be better from the point of view of a soldier who doesn't really want to fight anyway? So you are were a journalist. And as a journalist, seeing how journalism right now is working on this on, the, on this topic, what are your thoughts there? I mean, are, have you been approached by um, large me media for interviews or have you seen a lot of, of this viewpoint in the, the, the public sphere of the big uh, news media? A, a little. I mean... Why? Yeah. Uh... Well, where to begin? Um, firstly, lack of history. I mean, to understand Russia's position, I, I just, you know, wrote an essay for the British magazine Prospect, you know, pointing out the similarities between, you know, the post-imperial experience of the countries of the former Soviet Union and those of the French and British and other empires, you know, which leave, of course, endless territorial disputes and conflicts behind, um, or the Ottoman Empire for that matter. Uh, but of course, most journalists are not historians and never, I mean, they don't have the time, you know, I'm, I was unusual as, as a journalist, um, you know, who'd been previously trained as a historian. Um, and therefore, you know, you have a tendency to accept simple narratives. Uh, then, of course, there is the um, the Cold War anti-Russian narrative, uh, which um, various uh, journals and interests, you know, assiduously tried to keep going, um, you know, ever since the fall of the Soviet Union. Uh, you know, every um, Russian complaint, whether justified or unjustified, you know, uh, about the disenfranchisement of Russian speakers in the Baltic states, for example, uh, the Chechen war, you know, these little uh, territorial disputes in the in the Caucasus, you know, I mean, comparable really to um, minor territorial squabbles, you know, in, in Africa or whatever. Every one of them was blown up by sections of the Western media, you know, from the, you know, from 1991 on, as an attempt to restore the Soviet Union, and that this was right, you know, right, and you read this expansion, imperialism is in the Russian DNA, an attempt to reconstruct the Soviet Union is inevitable, blah, blah, blah. And a lot of journalists, you know, bought that throughout and continue to buy it. Um, and then, you know, there is the fact that, uh, and, you know, let's make no bones about it, the Putin regime is in many ways a very nasty one and has done a lot of nasty things, both internally, uh, but also um, with uh, extreme stupidity, brutality and incompetence um, has also got, gone out to murder its opponents um, abroad, you know, in Western Europe. Uh, which obviously, you know, is an offence against our sovereignty and international law. Now, of course, the Russians reply, well, but we turn a blind eye to Saudi Arabia um, uh, doing this. And, you know, America uses, we use assassination. I mean, it's certain public, of course, but, you know, we, we use assassinations. America uses drone attacks. Well, okay. But, I mean, A, do you really want to look like Mohammed bin Salman? <laughs> um, and B, uh, you know, uh, this is Europe. Um, you know, to be blunt, uh, we are willing in Europe to tolerate nasty things elsewhere in the world that for very good reasons uh, we have many more problems with when it's on our, on our territory. Uh, so, I mean, obviously the Putin regime has become uh, so, you know, seriously unpopular uh, 
uh, with many Western liberals who, in other circumstances, um, you know, might be inclined to take a, a much, you know, calmer and more restrained view of this. But in America, the disastrous thing was um, the c combination of Trump and what in the end were very, very limited Russian attempts to influence the, the elections of 2016. You know, all the attempts by American investigators to show a crucial Russian role either in, you know, in, in manipulating the elections or in manipulating Trump have basically failed, you know. Um, uh, where, where, and by the, whereas on the other hand, uh, the, the Clinton, Hillary Clinton's team's attempt to manufacture evidence to show Trump as a, a Russian agent, uh, you know, they are out there in plain sight, but the media ignores them. Um, and, but, you see, so the, Demo the supporters of the Democratic Party in America, um, on the basis of this, became pathologically anti-Russian from 2016 on. But you see, underlying this is the fact that, um, and you sometimes see this in Europe as well, um, they cannot bear to admit two things. One is that not a majority, of course, um, but very nearly 50% of the American people in uh, 2016 and 47% of the American people in 2020 did vote for Trump. You know, the Democrats won the popular vote, but you know, not by much. Uh, this, this is, you know, American liberals simply cannot bear to admit that their own country, you know, is so genuinely divided and that so many of their fellow citizens are genuinely so angry with the present system and hate the Democrats so much that they would vote for somebody like Trump. But the second thing is, of course, that the, the reason why um, uh, three out of the uh, last um, five US presidential elections uh, have been won by the uh, Republicans with a clear minority of the popular vote is nothing to do with Russia. It's to do with the crazy 18th century provisions of the US Constitution. But of course, A, the US Constitution is sacred, can't criticize it. And secondly, even if you do criticize it, you can't change it because the constitutional requirements for changing the Constitution are impossible in present circumstances. So how much better, of course, to say that in the end, or to believe that none of this is really to do with America at all, it's all to do with Putin, you know, Putin's manipulation. Uh, which is frankly an absurdity, but you know, when people cannot look the truth in the face, they look for lies instead. And that's what that's what scares me a lot that the internal failings of Western democracies, the United States, but also in Europe, we have we have enough of them as well, uh, do lead to externalizing all of this pain and uh, pointing the finger at two enemies, <laughs> Russia and China. Uh, and both of this is highly dangerous, right? Um, which leads me to the question of how to then um, to, to stabilize or at least to defuse the trigger points that could become these new Sarajevos. In the Pacific, it is clearly Taiwan that could trigger something absolutely horrible. And in, in Europe at the moment, I mean, Ukraine and Georgia are, are flashpoints. Um, so, which leads me to the next point. I mean, I'm, I have this neutrality network and it is kind of a no brainer for people like me who study neutrality that this would be, Ukraine would, is, the perfect example of a state and a situation that you could um, get get back rolling if you if you just decided to do what we already did for two hundred years to other points like my home country Switzerland like Austria just neutralize it and federalize. Now, what do you what do you see stands in what speaks for a neutral Ukraine and Macron actually kind of. Uh, recognize that now talking about the Finlandization, which in my view is the wrong term, absolutely the wrong term, but we'll, we'll talk about that. And the other thing is like, do you think it can happen or do you see the, the, the political stars not aligning? I, I mean, I strongly support this myself. I have, you know, written again and again in, in support of neutrality. You know, that, that was the line in my book of 1999. Um, and by the way, you know, once again, I've criticized Russia very strongly for its behavior, not, not, not just the West. 
Um, I don't think that that is possible today because uh, our governments, led of course by the United States, have so boxed themselves in by their rhetoric um, that I didn't think they can do that. Uh, I think it is still just possible that they might accept a moratorium on Ukrainian NATO membership, which, by the way, sacrifices nothing, since, as you said, Ukraine is not going to get into NATO anyway. So, you know, why not, um, you know, just say, look, this is delayed by 20 years while we try to sort out, you know, all the problems surrounding it. And of course, the, the, entirely, you know, there's an, a logical case there. Ukraine cannot join NATO as long as it has a war going on with Russian, you know, backed separatists in the Donbass. So uh, let us set out to you know, shelve this, to solve that war, to solve the political problems there and elsewhere with Russia, and then revisit this issue in 20 years time. Now, the, the thing is, though, that I, I, my most recent book actually was on climate change, uh, climate change in the nation state, which uh, came out last year. And I'm pretty convinced that by 20 years from now, um, certainly if you read all the predictions by 30 years from now, uh, the effects of climate change will have become so bad already. Uh, not so much the direct physical effects on the West, but the, 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 the effects on you know, weaker and more endangered societies in West Africa, for example, um, that all these problems with Russia, uh, and perhaps even with China as well, uh, will begin to assume their real perspective, you know, their real importance in historical terms, which is minor. So that was a technical problem in the uh, communication here. Um, but I think it's a good opportunity to actually wrap up also the uh, interview. And I would like to ask you, Anatole, um, you know, we've had we've seen in the past these neutrality movements inside Ukraine that did exist in the 1990s and up until 2014, depending on which um, the government was in power. And then, well, under Petro Poroshenko, that was uh, reversed. But Mr. Zelensky is kind of, or was at least portrayed as an outsider, as a comedian coming in. And there have been ideas, um, of, for example, by Steve Wold, that all that's needed at the moment to unblock the situation is to sell the Ukrainians and the current Ukrainian government that they themselves should declare neutrality. And then, then you get the process starting. And actually, you know, the Russians in their two declaration, uh, the two draft treaties, they didn't actually use the word neutrality. They described it in all, but they described it, but they didn't name it. So do you see any, any way forward to actually work with Ukraine in basically opting themselves for a neutral solution? Well, I think that, you know, a majority of Ukrainians would probably uh, go with that. It's worth noting that, you know, both Poroshenko and Zelensky were elected on platforms uh, of seeking um, relaxation of tension with Russia, you know, some kind of compromise with Russia. Uh, and I, I think also that with time, as it becomes evident to Ukrainians that there is in fact no chance of getting into NATO, uh, more and more Ukrainians will come round to the, the idea. Uh, also, of course, this would return agency to the hands of the Ukrainians, because of course this would be, a, as you say, a Ukrainian declaration. Uh, so Ukraine would cease to be what it really is at the moment, which is a plaything of, you know, east-west geopolitical confrontation. Um, the problem is, though, that as both Poroshenko and Zelensky uh, discovered, um, they are in permanent danger of being overthrown by radical nationalists who control a large part of the armed forces, uh, and also, as they demonstrated in 2014, have tremendous street power. And I fear that this is also one reason why the, the West has not put pressure on Ukraine, you know, actually to implement the Minsk peace agreement for fear that you would have the overthrow of the Ukrainian government by right wing forces. Now, of course, if that happened, it would, you know, that would play completely into Russia's hands, because Ukraine would, would be totally isolated at that point. Um, but uh, I, I mean, I, I would hope that sensible European governments um, might actually say this to the Ukrainians. Unfortunately, of course, you have uh, 
uh, a German government where, you know, the foreign minister um, e exemplifies, you know, what Max Weber called Gesinnungsethik, you know, a, a pretend, um, you know, ethical policy with, uh, of course, no, no willingness whatsoever to fight for Ukraine, uh, but entirely, you know, based on declarative ethics. Um, and France, as I said, is highly dependent on the United States in West Africa. So as we have seen for the previous seven years and more, or in fact, going all the way back to 2007, when the idea of uh, NATO membership for Ukraine first came up, um, French governments have been you know, willing to push back a bit against the more aggressive American policies, but they've never been willing to follow through I mean, as I have written, Macron could bring this entire crisis to an end uh, with four words, j'ai dit, non, uh, you know, just to say, no, um, France does, does not think we have any chance of ever defending Ukraine. And therefore, um, I declare on behalf of France that we've hereby veto Ukrainian NATO membership and will continue to do so. I think that would be, would be enough to end this present crisis. It wouldn't end, of course, the, the, the deeper issues. But somebody in Europe has to actually think about European security um, instead of constantly running back you know, under the, the wings of the United States, which I am less and less convinced gives a damn about European security, it gives a damn about American power. Well, you could say that's what an American government should do. But if America is going to think about, you know, American global domination, Europe has to think about European security. My fear is that we are simply incapable as a continent of doing so. Very last question. What do you think will the impact of the current crisis be on um, other, other developments, especially China? Well, as I often said, um, you know, a great deal of, of US policy over the past 20 years in the Middle East, but in Europe as well, um, might, might have been designed in Beijing, um, you know, because of the extent to which it actually serves China's interests. Above all, of course, if uh, Europe does cut itself off from Russian gas as a result of sanctions, um, that will tremendously strengthen China's energy security, because it will then be able to get all its energy overland from Russia instead of by sea from the Middle East uh, along routes which America can interdict in the event of war. Yeah. So it yeah. will certainly strengthen China. I mean, my other fear, though, is that uh, especially with the emphasis being thrown back on energy security, you know, uh, that this is going to be a very severe blow to action against climate change. Um, you know, we've we've already seen uh, the you know multiple failures of um, of European action against climate change. Um, and now all the talk in America is how, oh, you know, we, we've, we've got to forget about, um, you know, green energy and, and action to reduce climate change because the only thing that matters is energy security against Russia. So I fear that this will be a, a bad blow to climate change for which I, I think our descendants a hundred years from now will not forgive us. Um, I, I mean, think about a historian 100 years from now, looking back and saying, everybody in the West acknowledged that Ukraine couldn't be a member of NATO. And yet they insist on keeping open the possibility, the principle of Ukraine being a member of NATO. And this led to a huge international crisis in which for months on end, climate change was completely forgotten. I mean, were these people crazy? I think they will look on us as they, as we look on our ancestors before 1914, you know, and ask, you know, how can they have been so, so utterly stupid? Euro nearly all European conflicts of the last couple of hundred year, well, years were utterly dumb, if you look at the big picture. And I think this one is just another one. Uh, I just, I would hope we can diffuse it. Um, oh, I, I mean, uh, uh, you know, I suppose at the heart of realist thinking is is ultimately the idea that um, man is a fallen being and human perfection is not to be looked for. Um, as a historian, uh, I keep hoping that we will learn from history, and I keep being disappointed. Yeah, but but looking looking at history, it's also unlikely that we'll do so because we're pretty bad at it. <laughs> we're yeah. res res yeah. resilient to learning. Um, anyhow, Anatole, thank you very much for agreeing to this interview, for giving us your insights. Um, I hope to talk to you soon again.
and we will go on working for neutrality. Let's do it. <laughs> Thank, Thank you so you. much. And have a good evening. Bye. Bye-bye.